Greetings to you all. Greetings to all. Welcome tonight to our special provost lecture. My name is Mark Sargent. I serve as the provost here at Westmont, and it's a real delight to, uh, to introduce this uh, special session. Uh, it's, our theme tonight is certainly appropriate as we're entering a theme of a uh, season of Thanksgiving, uh, and there's certainly much reason to be grateful uh, this evening. Uh, we're grateful for your presence and participation in the, in the intellectual and spiritual life of Westmont. Uh, and we're extremely grateful for the Martin Institute and the Dallas Willard Center and their uh, sponsorship of an annual book award. Uh, tomorrow we look forward to the, uh, the formal presentation of the book award at our chapel service. So if you're able to attend that service, please, please come tomorrow at 1030 and see the formal presentation of the award. We're also extremely grateful for F and Patty Martin who are the generous supporters of the Martin Institute and in so many ways the supporters of Westmont College and, and our work here. Patty serves on our Board of Trustees and she will be introducing uh, our speaker tomorrow at the chapel service. Tonight we have the privilege of F being the one that will introduce our speaker. Uh, F has been the Managing Director and Partner at Goldman Sachs. Uh, he serves on the board of Pepperdine uh, and is highly involved in Menlo Park Presbyterian Church. And for the past several decades, he and Patty have been deeply involved in the study and in the support of spiritual formation and spiritual direction. Uh, I can assure you that they are incredibly generous and hospitable people who give great deal to support many individuals who are pursuing uh, spiritual direction paths and spiritual formation activities and just warm, wonderful people. And F, it's a, it's a pleasure to invite you to come introduce our speaker tonight. So thank you, F. Well, it is indeed my honor to uh, introduce Robert Emmons, but I'll just make a, a brief mention of, of uh, why this award was created. This is our first uh, book award, and so I think it's, uh, I'm really honored that we could have such an incredible uh, book and, and such a wonderful person that would uh, join us for this inaugural uh, event. Uh, as part of the uh, Martin Institute for Christianity and Culture, the Dallas Willard Center uh, desires to help place an enduring emphasis on the intellectual legacy of Dallas Willard, including his focus on the possibility and the path to authentic spiritual and moral transformation. One of Dallas's uh, great remarks in the prelude to uh, um, uh, the, his book on the spiritual disciplines was, my central claim is this, I believe that authentic change is possible. And uh, that is actually a pretty revolutionary thought that we could indeed be seriously transformed into the image of Christ. And so um, a, a specific focus within the mission of the uh, Dallas Willard Center is to promote and facilitate the expansion of four intellectual commitments that uh, characterize Dallas's work throughout his career and that he indicated that he would like to see perpetuated in the future. These include uh, a, a robust metaphysical realism, uh, epistemolo epistemological realism, the study of knowledge, the development of comprehensive, sophisticated, integrative models of the human person. If you've read uh, Renovation of the Heart, you'll see his work there. And then finally, the one that is most relevant tonight, the development of objective measurement for different Christian formative practices that in principle can place these practices in the domain of publicly accessible knowledge. And so the book awards are intended to be one way that we can uh, work to promote and recognize exemplary uh, scholarship in one or more of these areas of critical concern. Uh, Robert Emmons is, uh, a, has done a wonderful job of, of picking up on this. Uh, his book won because it is one of the finest examples of where Dallas wanted to see this scholarship go, of how uh, authentic spiritual change is possible and how it works. Uh, Bob was or is a, a professor of psychology at UC Davis and is an expert really in the science of gratitude. I like to say that you know gratitude has been around for quite a long time, but the science of gratitude has not. And he has done more than almost any person alive to bring this into the realm of scientific uh, investigation 
and to uh, under, help, help us understand that gratitude genuinely is important and how it actually works. He is the founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Positive Psychology and continues uh, uh, many efforts uh, in terms of uh, propelling the science forward. Now, uh, after uh, Bob uh, graces us with some uh, prepared remarks, we'll have a Q&A period. And Jane Wilson, who has actually done uh, a great deal of study and gave a chapel talk on some of Bob's work uh, last year, will be uh, uh, posing a few questions. But uh, thereafter, uh, please, uh, any time that something comes up, take your pen and fill out the 3 by 5 card, and you can pass it in, and you'll get a chance to have those questions answered, answered as well. I will say this, that um, the other thing that makes this particularly pleasurable for me is that Bob and Dallas had uh, some very meaningful interactions. And in the hardback copy of, uh, of the book, Thanks, the New Science of Gratitude, Dallas wrote, based upon a solid and growing body of research, Robert Emmons presents clear and practical ways in which everyone can begin to immensely improve their quality of life, starting right now, right where they are. And so uh, that's a pretty exciting thing for us to be able to learn about. And Bob, we're very grateful that you would be here tonight. Thank you. What does the fire marshal say about this many people in this room? <laughs> Is he okay with that? All right, anyway. I know. It's really cool to see the turnout. Um, you know, when, when you were reading those criteria, I was sure glad you got to number four, because if it was based on the first three, I would have had no chance. To know that. I don't even understand what those first three are. But uh, so thank you for that great introduction. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor and humbled by this uh, award. Uh, I did meet Dallas on just one occasion, but as you said, it was quite uh, meaningful. I was telling people today about that. It was almost 10 years ago, so he and I were at this conference together, and uh, Jeff, maybe you were there also at USC at uh, Dallas's home institution, and it was uh, for this uh, foundation that uh, I was on the board of advisors for, and he was a guest, special guest on this occasion, and we found ourselves sitting across the table at one of the uh, thematic uh, breakout sessions on the science of forgiveness, and the group was strategizing about what should we do now. We've learned some things about forgiveness, what it is and how to do it and why it matters, but what's the next stage? And so the point at which you go around as you do in these small groups and introduce yourself and say who you are and what you do, I mentioned that what I did, I was writing a book on gratitude, and afterward during the break when we all got up, he said to me, he says, Robert, uh, I'd like a copy of that book. Could you send it to me? I said, I mean, I didn't say that, but I was thinking, Dallas Willard wants my book? Sure, no problem, you know, absolutely. You know, it was amazing uh, that he'd be interested in what I had to say. Uh, you know, I think that's just the way he was. You know, he wanted to learn uh, from people and people who had no, you know, reputation or experience. And I had never published a book before. I just did journal articles, which we know nobody reads in academia. <laughs> you know, the average journal article is read by like seven people, which is true, they've done those studies. And I thought, uh, you know, the people who funded my research said, you really need to branch out a bit. Uh, you know, what about writing a book for, you know, a, a larger audience? And so that was my first foray into it. It was a lot of fun. It was a challenge with different kind of writing. I learned a lot. I was very bad at it at first, uh, but I got a little bit better thanks to some good editing and even better uh, agent uh, work on the book with me. So uh, it was awesome to do that and just the impact that you can have when you write a book that the average person can read and benefit from, but also academics can read. And, uh, you know, intelligent, educated public can read as well. Uh, it's really cool. And books that, you know, will sell in Christian bookstores and books that you get you invited to speak at churches and speak at Southwest Airlines, where I was last week, and even talk to a group of lawyers, as I did two weeks ago. You know, it's amazing that this many different audiences could converge on a topic like gratitude. Uh, it's really amazing. So, so thank you. So Dallas, I, so then I got to sit next to, I didn't get to, I actually, I strategically chose to sit next to him at lunch. I thought, here's my chance. I want to talk to this man, learn, take in, you know, from him what he had learned about the spiritual life, because I was interested myself in, in learning more and learn, taking advantage of this opportunity. So talked to him about a lot of different topics, you know, about faith, about his church, about what he was doing. And I asked him at one point, I said, you know, I noticed that you don't say much about gratitude uh, in your writings. 
Okay, it's not included amongst the spiritual disciplines, although it's a you know, pretty comprehensive, systematic list. I said, so, so tell me, uh, where's gratitude? And he thinks about it for a moment very thoughtfully, as he did for any question I imagine that he was ever asked. And he was chewing his food, put down his fork, and he said, celebration. He said, gratitude is about celebration. Right? And it's true, when I went back and looked at the Spirit of the Disciplines, he said that we engage in celebration when we receive life and all its gifts with enjoyment as we dwell on the greatness of who God is and what he has done for us. Then he wrote in this book also, Holy delight and joy is the great antidote to despair and is a wellspring of genuine gratitude. So he links together delight, enjoyment, rejoicing, right, uh, with the concept of gratitude through celebration. And I thought that's, that's really what it's all about, uh, you know. And um, by the way, I originally gave a title different from this one, and that's both the beauty and curse of uh, PowerPoint that you can change right up to the moment that you give a talk. And so I did that because uh, that's just what you do when you do this is that you think with PowerPoint. Aristotle, you know, the great thinker, said that we, we never think without an image, without pictures. Well, professors never think without PowerPoints. So that's kind of the modern 21st century version of what Aristotle said. So um, hopefully you can see. If not, no big deal. I'll just tell you what's in these slides. So I decided instead to entitle the talk, God, Grace, Gratitude, and the Gospel. And then I ran out of G's and I ran out of space. So, so but that's, you go pretty far just on those four. Uh, and that's what I'll do. So I want to start with a, a quote, not from, uh, from Dallas, although we did already, and we'll come back and talk about him a little bit later, but one of my other spiritual heroes uh, is Brother David Steindl Rast, who I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a Benedictine monk, and he actually is the world's foremost, foremost authority on gratitude. And Brother David also sees Gratitude as basically a celebration. But he goes on, he says, celebration is an act of heightened emotional intellectual appreciation. I thought that's really cool. That, that's what, when you think about celebration, we're really intensifying our normal affect, our emotions. When people gather in the great gratitude holiday two weeks from now, Thanksgiving, right? That's, that's a celebration. When someone has a birthday, we have a celebration for that person. We're saying thank you for being you, for being alive, for being amongst us as we celebrate the goodness of faith, freedom, football, and all those great Fs that we celebrate on Thanksgiving uh, holiday. So gratitude is basically, I think that's a good way to think about it. There's lots of ways I could spend hours just defining gratitude, but who wants to do that? That's for seminars, not for a, uh, a short talk. So I want to talk about the trends in the uh, development of the science of gratitude. Now, this is really interesting to see what's happened in the last five years. I don't know if you can see that. I can't move because I'm supposed to stay in front of the camera. But anyway, the, basically, the point of this graph is that there's been more research on gratitude in the last five years than the previous f uh, almost 50 years of research. I mean, there's been an acceleration in the amount of studies in the science of Gratitude. So when people uh, ask me, like reporters who want to be journalists, who want to get a story this time of year, you'll start to see articles in your newspapers. Uh, there's still newspapers, right, around here? There's not too many anymore, print papers. But anyway, there's, there's articles that appear in places, right, on the Internet. And they want to know, what's the latest science of gratitude? What do we know about it? We want to, you know, enlighten people as we celebrate the annual gratitude holiday. And so they think it's relatively new. Well, it only seems relatively new because it's such an old concept, it's been ignored for so long. And what I've tried to do is to recapture that and to kind of bring it back into the forefront to get people to notice and talk about the importance of gratitude and thankfulness by shining the light of science. You know, you take a concept that's been around for thousands of years that it's been written about in philosophies and, of course, in religious scriptures, and use the tools of modern science. People pay attention to it. Seemingly things that have been ignored uh, become new again when you show that it matters, that gratitude works various ways in people's lives. How does it work? Well, we found, I'm not going to go through all the findings, but basically 
when you examine gratitude as a practice and connect it to people's lives, to their well-being, to their performance, to their functioning emotionally, psychologically, relationally. I'm a positive psychologist, I guess. I'm not really. I'm a psychologist who happens to dabble in fields that now have been called positive psychology. Uh, it's like saying you're a Christian psychologist. What does that mean? It means your psychologist is also a Christian, right? <laughs> uh, I've studied gratitude because I think it's important. I think we need more of it. Uh, the scriptures tell us it's important. It's a positive topic. Somebody's got to do it, right? There's lots of reasons why it's a good, it's, it's an uplifting topic, right? There's worse things you could study than gratitude, uh, for sure, right? Lots of them, and we do that. We're specialized, we specialists in that, in psychology, studying the bad, what goes wrong in people's lives, but why not study the good? Turns out there's a lot of good to gratitude. That gratitude is good, that gratitude works, that gratitude brings benefits in virtually every domain that's been examined, from relational to psychological to physical to spiritual, the grateful mind reaps a massive advantage. And we document this in our study. I mean, I'm just one person. I, you know, I did the first couple of studies, but now laboratories around the world have expanded the initial research. And just six panels on this one slide show various ways in which gratitude works in terms of emotional health in terms of people become more giving, forgiving, more generous when they're practicing gratitude or when they are grateful people, which we can identify through our questionnaires. They handle stress better, both catastrophic traumatic stress as well as the little everyday, what I call the slow drip of everyday stress. Just grateful people handle this kind of stress better. They learn more from it. They see the stress as opportunities. They're less depressed they're less likely to suffer from emotional and psychological diagnosable conditions. I mean, the list goes on and on. So much so, you have to work very hard to find no relationship between gratitude and some outcome. Uh, so much so that you, you could say you can never really overplay the hand of gratitude, that it just brings so many benefits, which is great. We've done well so far in what we've done, but, you kind of figure there's going to be a butt coming in somewhere, right? If we were done, of course, we'd be all finished now and could go home, close up shop, move on to a new topic. But I think, actually, uh, we've ignored what I think is the most important part of gratitude. This has all been great, what we've done so far, but I think there's one sphere which has been virtually ignored that we need to make a lot of progress in, and I'll get to that a little bit later. A lot of potential, though, still. And we've learned a lot but there's a lot more that needs to be done. So uh, originally I was going to talk about 10 things that I've learned about gratitude. I've been doing this for 15 years. I thought that would be a good uh, angle to take, right? Lessons I've learned, 10 things I've learned, but I can only think of six. So, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. You, know, you do some 15 years, you should know more than six. right? So I thought I'll, I'll scrap that and I'll go with the God and grace gratitude the gospel. Where else can I talk? I can't talk at UC Davis, talk about the gospel, right? I mean, it just, I could, but I kind of want to keep my job. You know, and people are more sensitive nowadays about things. It used to be free speech on, well, that's another issue on campuses. But anyway, this is a good angle to take, though, myths about gratitude, because there are a lot of myths out there, false beliefs that people have that can get in the way of gratitude. Whether you're talking about Christian people or non-Christian people, there are false ideas. So it's kind of fun for me as a researcher to explore these myths, show how just they are myths, where do they come from, why do they exist, why do they persist, and how we can use scientific data maybe to challenge some of these myths. These, these are things which hold people back from fully embracing gratitude and most of you, I suspect, probably, you know, pretty much uh, are believers when it comes to the importance of gratitude or belief that gratitude works. And, but there are people out there who have questions and raise objections, and uh, partly because of these myths about the nature. So let's list these. I won't go into all of those. I should be cognizant of the time. So what I'll do... Oh, it's early. We've got lots of time. Uh, put, you know what it means when a professor puts his watch on the lectern like this? So it means when a Baptist preacher does that, it means the same thing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so, okay. so anyway. You said I had two hours, right? Okay. Anyway. So Baptist, there's some preacher in me. Uh, 
I took an occupational test when I was in high school before I knew what I wanted to do. They made us take that, right, I guess, figure out what you wanted to do. And the profile that fit me best was psychologist. Uh, and then I saved that. I went back. I looked at it years later, okay? Uh, I just, because I'm a guy, I just save everything, you know, much to the consternation of my wife. You throw that away, right? You, know, you don't use it anymore. But anyway, years later, I looked at it, and the number two, it said minister, right? That was best suited for that. So that's kind of interesting. There's some validity, I guess, to that. But I don't know. I think professor's better because then... You don't have to help people like you do when you're a pastor, right? <laughs> well, enough of that. Uh, so the myths. Grad number one, you hear this. Gratitude is just happy thinking. It's just happyology, positive thinking, looking on the bright side, right? That's all gratitude is. That's one belief that's out there that people have. Okay, so I'll list these, and then we'll explore them or explode them as the case might be. Gratitude is merely a stepping stone for personal happiness. It's just a strategy or tactic. That's no better or no worse, no greater or no lesser than any other tactic or strategy that you could use to become a happy. Right? Is it just about happiness per se? This one you may have heard. If you're grateful, you're going to be less uh, interested in making changes or working hard. That gratitude strips people of initiative, makes them complacent even uh, gives them a feeling of resignation. You know, it, makes, it makes us lazy and lethargic. Mm -hmm. If you're grateful, hey, uh, I'm just satisfied with whatever I've got or what the situation is in life. Why bother changing it? It's uh, meant to be this way. It almost is this fatalistic uh, attitude. Number four, gratitude is something that you go out and get. You can get more of it, right? You can go out there and work hard at it, exert effort, and become better at it. Well, that's actually a myth about gratitude, as I've recently discovered. In number five, vertical gratitude precludes horizontal gratitude. By that I mean gratitude toward God precludes gratitude toward other people. If you're grateful to God for some good outcome in your life, some victory, some redemptive twist, some success, some miraculous event happened, you're not going to give credit to other people. That's actually a belief and I'll give you some illustrations uh, shortly. Okay, number one, is gratitude just positive thinking? Well, that's an easy one. I mean, you just look at any definition of gratitude. There's no definition which would say it's about thinking nicely about things or thinking that things are good. Obviously, that's part of it. When you're grateful, you acknowledge and recognize goodness in the world. You see that other forces, other people, God, God's supernatural agents are behind the good things that we have. So yeah, there is goodness, but it's much beyond that. There's an entire elaborate set of appraisals we make that I didn't deserve this. It came to me quite apart from any merit on my own. I didn't do anything to earn or deserve these good outcomes, but someone decided to do this for me anyway, right? There's a more elaborate set of processes, as well as we found, and I write about this in Thanks, that if you focus on bad things that have happened to you in the past, that's actually a good way, not a good way, a great way to activate current gratitude. You could do that right now, in fact. I, if we had time, we'd do some more experiential exercises, which are always fun to do in a smaller group. Uh, you know, think about the worst thing. In fact, I have in instructions that uh, I call remember the bad. You think about the worst moments, your losses, your stuff. Something traumatic had happened to you at some point in the past, but here you are today, and you made it through that time. You've survived that, right? You've endured the temptation. You've got through that trial. You survived. The, maybe it was a bad relationship. You made your way out of the dark. So you remember the bad things. You see where you are now. Now, if you're in the middle of that, it might not work. But generally, we can find things in the past that we've experienced, but we've benefited from in some way. We've learned some new skills. We found some opportunities. We can now be grateful for those events. And there's been many experiments showing this is a very effective way to elicit and activate and strengthen gratitude in the present by focusing on how far we've come in the past. So that's not positive thinking, right? That's just the opposite. That's focusing on what's, what's gone wrong. So how can it be that it's just dwelling on the good that produces gratitude? Here's a definition of gratitude, which I like, by the, um, uh, I think it was a philosopher, David Harned, tw almost 20 years ago, said that 
gratitude is an attitude toward the giver. So they starts with that. It's not about the gift that you received. It's toward the giver of that gift. It's an attitude toward that gift. Okay? It's a determination to use that gift well, to employ it imaginatively and inventively with the, in accordance with the giver's intention. So, again, that doesn't sound like it's just this happy thinking, right? There, there's a responsibility there. When you've been given a gift and you're grateful for that, you want to take care of it. You want to cherish it, right? Even if it's this, you know, ugly soup tureen grandma gave you for your wedding gift, you're not going to put it out in the garage sale next week. No, you might wait a year or so. I mean, if, if she came over, you'd probably serve soup out of it, right? Because it's the right thing to do. I mean, you would take care of that because it... Part of her was given in that gift, right? The giver is in the gift itself. So you have this, this um, obligation to, to cherish it, to uh, value it, to protect it, to invest resources in it. I think that's what Harnett is getting at in this intention. So, I mean, it's very easy to explode that first myth by saying there's a lot more to gratitude than just thinking about nice things that are going right in my life at this time. Okay? Is that good? Are we good? So... Here's another myth, that gratitude encourages passivity. You hear this one sometimes in the halls of academia where, you know, I mean, we're trained to be contrarians, and that's a great thing because you're very careful about reviewing research studies, about reviewing grant proposals. And, you know, we train Carmel in the graduate school at UC Davis, right, one of our success stories. And uh, uh, it's not often that the direction comes from graduate students up there to teaching here. I like to get undergraduates who are here as graduate students at Davis because I know now they've been trained well, they're smart, but they're also good people. So send us your students. You know, that's good. We, we, we need more good students who are, yeah, you gonna apply? Talk to me afterward. Anybody, you know anybody, talk to me afterward. Never have enough uh, good students. But anyway, what was the point? Contrarian, right? Thank you. What's, what's wrong in a situation? Okay, so why is gratitude a bad idea, they say? Well, they say, you know, well, weren't there cases historically where people were told to be grateful and therefore they didn't try harder, they accepted their situation, you know, they, they didn't want to make changes where it would be useful sometimes to make changes. And, but yet you can't find any research evidence of that. Uh, I've never talked to a person who's found that gratitude made them made them lazy or complacent or got them to stop striving or trying to do something. So we did a study. We asked people to tell us goals you wanted to accomplish. Write down five things you want to accomplish in the next two months. Right? It could be anything. It could be relational. It could be academic, occupational, spiritual. Five goals. We tracked their progress, self-rated progress. How successful do you think you were in achieving those goals? We asked them, two months later when the uh, time period was up. We correlated their gratitude scores with whether or not they perceive success. They're also keeping gratitude journals or diaries in our study so we could compare people who were doing that versus people who were doing something else, which was a hassles journal where you're writing down all the bad stuff going wrong each day, which is like you know, business as usual for most people. Okay? <laughs> Couldn't find parking, you know, the uh, issues, all that stuff. Uh, that students and others have that we've studied. Well, it turned out that those who were writing about gratitude were more successful at achieving their goals, but they were less satisfied with how much progress they were making. It wasn't like, oh, hey, I'm happy, you know, I'm a five on a 10 point scale, that's good enough, you know, I'll move on to something else now. And gratitude within each goal also predicted uh, continued effort to strive to achieve that goal. So gratitude leads to purpose. It leads people to, it energizes them to work harder toward things they've identified as important. So it's easy to bust that myth, again, about that gratitude makes you lazy, complacent, lethargic. You just want to lay on the couch and eat potato chips. No, it's, that's not what grateful people do. They're inspired to do things. I mean, philanthropy is inspired by gratitude. How many stories do you hear about people who make great donations, big donations to medical centers because of gratitude for the medical care they or family members? I mean, it happens every day, right? It's gratitude leads to great things. It doesn't make you self-absorbed. Okay, so we're getting uh, through these. Something that you go out and get, vertical gratitude precedes horizontal. So 
This is an idea I've been developing uh, more recently, although I've suggested there's ways in which we can practice gratitude. I think there are good ways and not so good ways that has ramifications for more general spiritual formation. I mean, gratitude is a microcosm. It's, it's an illustration of how we might want to grow. You might want to go out and, and become more forgiving or become more humble or become more compassionate or more loving. All these great you know, spiritual uh, um, realities or qualities you might want to develop. What's the best way to do that? Well, there's lots. You can immerse yourself in traditions. You can engage in various uh, prayerful practices and so on. Well, gratitude, by its very nature, is about focusing outward. It's about what other people or other beings outside of us are doing for us that we can't do or provide things for ourselves. We start to focus on gratitude. The risk is that it becomes all about us, a very self-focused project or pursuit. And so it actually starts to undermine our ability to be successful at it. Martin Luther said, the, the more successful we are, the worse off we are. You know, right? He said, there's more benefits from failure than from success. Because the success makes us very proud of our success. I, I know this from my own experience. I tried this out a couple of years ago. I started doing a gratitude app on my phone, which you can do. There's lots of them now that you can download to your iPhone or if you use something inferior to an iPhone, you can do that too, <laughs> which would be anything else. And you know, there's tons of these now, gratitude journals or gratitude, I did a gratitude tree, where you post a leaf, a leaf pops up on this tree, which is bare, just the branches, right? And you, you put down what you're grateful for, who you're grateful to, you type it in on your phone, and you hit enter and this leaf appears with what you wrote, or you can include a picture you know, of that person or whatever uh, each day. Uh, and so one, so one day, every day for a month, and if you do it every day systematically, by the end of the month, you've got a tree that's full of leaves. It looks really nice, right? It's a nice visual. Uh, it looks great. Okay. But if you're forgetful, uh, like I am, you get to the end of the month, and your tree's barren. Uh, you know, it looks like the trees up in Northern California in, in December. There's nothing on them, right? It, it looks, you know, it's very depressing to see a tree uh, like that, especially when you're supposed to be writing down your gratitudes and posting them on, you can't go back, you forget one today, uh, tomorrow I can't go back and enter one for today, you know, I'm screwed, right? I gotta try again tomorrow. Well, what I found was that when I remembered to do it, I felt really good about myself. Yeah, this is great, you know, aren't I great? I'm so proud of myself. When I forgot to do it, I felt really guilty, I felt really bad. It's like, here I am, I'm supposed to be this gratitude expert, that people, you know, want to hear me talk and, and, you know, I write books that people read and it's like, I can't remember to keep a list of what I'm grateful for. I felt guilty. So in neither case did I feel grateful. It's like, that's weird. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Well, then I realized I was thinking about my own performance. I wasn't focusing on other, what other people were doing for me or what God had been doing for me or did for me. It was all about my own performance. So it's kind of like the happiness findings too from the science of happiness where they show that trying too hard to be happy actually undermines your ability to be happy, right? Because it becomes as a byproduct of, of you know, purposeful activity and devotion to something outside of yourself. And so, it is, so that's another myth. That, now, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's a bad idea to try to be grateful. I mean, it's certainly a better idea than trying to be ungrateful. <laughs> we wouldn't say, we wouldn't go that far. But still, there, there's just a little caution there that you can make it all about yourself. So, see, I used to think that gratitude was something you go out and get, like humility. I got to go out and get more humility, go out and get more love, go out and get more whatever, right? It turns out it didn't work that way. I mean, then I realized it was just looking at, at what I already had and just living in that reality. I didn't have to go out and do anything special. It was just living in how I already was supported and sustained by other people and by God. And that's what made me grateful. Whoops, uh, let's go back to that. So number uh, five, vertical gratitude precedes, so is, or precludes, is it the case that when people are grateful to God, and that's something that a lot of people hold that belief, particularly uh, non-believers. And every time something happens, like, uh, I think I have some images. Yeah, so something, some uh, event happens, public proclamation made of gratitude, 
it's, it's just fascinating to see their response. The, so the public's response, the public proclamations of gratitude. So 18 years ago, you might remember when the McCoy septuplets were born. Some of you were younger, have no idea what I'm talking about. But those of us who are older in uh, Carlisle, Iowa, right? They're going to be 18 years old, like next week. The septup Imagine that having seven 18-year-olds. It'd be only worse than having seven two-year-olds or three-year-olds, right? <laughs> they probably had a couple good years somewhere in there, but I don't know. I, we had one child at the time, and our hands were full, you know, having seven. But anyway, you know, I mean, I, it's still very vivid to see the dad get on television and talk about this miracle, right, and how much gratitude they had and how much praise they gave God for delivering. The, the, there was never before seven healthy septuplets born in the United States, so that was the first time. It was a wonderful, you know, uh, evangelical moment. Uh, how do people respond? Well, they critique them. They say, well, don't they know that, you know, it was the fertility drugs? You know, it was the doctors. And, and so I write about them at the beginning of the chapter on gratitude in the human spirit and thanks. And, well, they knew that quite well. They gave plenty of thanks to the medical staff. But ultimately, they thank God for this miracle because and that's what happens with these things happen where, where you, human agency is insufficient to account for the why they happened. So whether it's a miraculous healing, whether it's the birth of septuplets, whether it's the miners in Chile, uh, 33, you know, the movie's coming out like tomorrow, right? So go see it. It's supposed to be good. And I don't know if they deal with the faith issue at all, but these miners were, were men of deep faith. Uh, if not before, then certainly afterward. Many of the stories that came out is, you know the story, right? They were underground for over two months, right? 700 meters uh, underground, 2,000 feet. Uh, when they emerged... They were given a shirt that said, thank you, God, right? And there was like a scripture quote on the back, and, and they came out, and, and this was um, Mario Gomez was the, was the last, or he was the oldest, actually, like 63 years old. Still remember watching this. You know, like a billion people saw this. Did you guys see that? You know, it's just transfixed by it, right? It's, they, nobody didn't believe they'd still be alive after all this time. But they were sending, you know, Bibles down to them, and all this, you know, it was, it was amazing what was going on course prayer and came up and you know and gave first thing he just got on his knees and thank God for his his rescue right uh, Mario Sepulveda was the second one to be rescued and he was the first to speak to the press and he said God and the devil were fighting over me and God won he said I always knew they would get me out I always had faith in the professionals here in Chile and in the great creator okay well um Predictably, there was outrage from people, like there was with the septuplets. You know, people said, you know, how dare they thank God, right? They said, I just have a couple of quotes. It's just fascinating to me. It's like, I don't see that God did anything. If not for the efforts of fellow human beings, the poor guys would have been stuck there till they died. For those who believe in God, for, no, listen, for those who believe God did something, what exactly is it that he did? The engineers were meticulous, drilling multiple holes and testing every uh, step of the way. If God wanted to produce a miracle, he could have done better than this. Why didn't he conjure up an earthquake to create a fissure that they could escape through? Why make them suffer all those weeks? Right, so, I mean, that happens on a regular basis you know, when people have these public proclamations. I mean, you know, it's like... Really? Why can't they have their, you know, why can't they give thanks to God without being critiqued? I don't know. Again, like the McCoys, they didn't just attribute their rescue to God. They said, here we are, you know, we're down here. They said, we want the world to know that we're not alone. They were sending messages back up, you know, in little capsules, right? We have our government, our workers, our companions sacrificing their days and hours and moments that they could be enjoying with their families. I mean, they were grateful to multiple uh, benefactors in this case. It wasn't just God or humans, but again, that's the myth, is that you're grateful to God. You can't be grateful to other people. When the um, uh, Ebola patient, Dr. Brantley, right, and this was more recent, okay, uh, was healed from this disease, same thing, right? He thanks God. He's, he's criticized right away. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, what about all the people who died from it, right? God's 
Dr. Brantley said, God saved my life. Someone said, no, the drugs did. This is an insult to the families of all who died of Ebola. And I say it was the hard work of doctors, researchers, and pilots that saved his life. And I like, I like this one just because it's, I think it's funny. Uh, Ebola, so they were all responding to the headline, Ebola patient says, God saved my life. The person wrote, really? Notice, though, when he needed help, he went to a hospital, not to a church. It's like, well, I mean, you know, why are these mutually exclusive, right? Why is it that because, you know, the, this impoverished view that, you know, it's either God or people, but it can't be both, that God doesn't work. Anyway, but Brantley, like McCoy, like the miners, said, you know, I want to express my deep and sincere gratitude to Samaritan's Purse, uh, to all the people involved in my treatment and care. Above all, I am thankful to God for sparing my... So again, he's not making these distinctions like the other people are. So that's just another myth. That vertical gratitude doesn't preclude horizontal gratitude. Um, I'll skip over that one. That's just a little quote since I'm, we're running short on uh, time. Got about an hour left, right? No. <laughs> Fourth trying. Uh, so I say we've made a lot of progress, but there's a lot more we can do, especially when it comes to gratitude toward God. I think that's really been ignored, uh, omitted, neglected. We, we've done a good job with the, with the horizontal gratitude in, as an interpersonal uh, ethic, as part of relationships. But what about people who are grateful to their supreme benefactor and creator and redeemer and sustainer? I mean, we, we don't really we haven't studied that. We haven't taken that part of it. Uh, seriously so far, in all the research projects that have been done, there's only been a handful of studies that have examined theistic gratitude, gratitude toward God, which we know differs from other forms of gratitude in a lot of different ways. And again, I won't go through all of these. Sorry, I don't have so many. You always overestimate how much you can get in there. But one of the points I want to make, I think the most important point, is that, gra that gratitude in a Christian person looks different than it does in a non-Christian for lots of reasons. Part of this is because you can have it in all circumstances, like in the face of suffering. Okay. Obviously, it's, it's biblical, it's theocentric, but Christocentric, I mean, it's rooted in, in our redemptive history. Maybe the most important, though, is that the connection to grace, that grace does not depend on gratitude, that giving does not depend on gratitude. I don't know about you, but me, uh, when I give a gift, I kind of like, I, I like to get the gratitude, I kind of expect people to say thank you when I do something for them, right? When I give a gift to my kids, I kind of expect that. I learn not to from my older boy, the younger one, more grateful. Uh, but, you know, so you change your expectations over time. But still, when Jesus gives, though, there's no expectation of gratitude in return. I mean, you think about, there's a quote, by the way, about ingratitude, which I want to talk about ingratitude. I don't have time, so... I'll have to come back and do that on another occasion because uh, I think that's really important too. We ignore ingratitude sometimes. We just focus on the positivity. Just Ignatius Loyola talked about ingratitude as being the worst of all sins, right? Forgetting of, of God. Uh, beginning, he says, it's the cause, beginning, and origin of all evil and sin is ingratitude. So I mean, that's pretty powerful, right? And I take that seriously. So if he says it, you know, I believe that, right? And it's like, okay. Um, but the parable, when Jesus heals the ten lepers, right, who see him from a distance, you, know, you all know the story, right? Uh, have, have pity on us, you know, master. And he says, you know, go show yourselves to the priests, right, where the, the public health officials have to declare the lepers clean so they can reenter society. And here they've been banished, right? They live separate, uh, you know, isolated and... Jesus does a ton for these, you know, lepers, right? He heals them. He gives them back their lives. They can return to their homes for the first time. They can kiss their wives, hug their children, get their dignity back, right? It's not just healing their skin, but they got their lives back, right? And one comes back and is grateful. Now, I always thought this was a story. This is the way I was taught it. It was a story about how awful it is that the nine didn't come back. And look at that one. He's the role model. You know, do what he did. He's the grateful one, Right? And that's one way to interpret this. But then I heard a different interpretation of it, which I thought was very cool, because, you know, when you're in your 50s, you learn something new about the Scriptures. It's very exciting, right? And so on. So it's never too late. Um, 
What was interesting and what was surprising about the story is neither one of those facts, the nine or the one, but the fact is that Jesus freely gave, freely healed, knowing full well that only one was going to come back, right? But he gave anyway. I mean, he was God. He knew that they weren't going to be thankful, but it didn't hold him back. He didn't hold back or relinquish the healing, even though he knew nine were not going to be grateful. Now, we put ourselves in that position. Would we give knowing that 90% of the gifts we give are not going to be met with thanks. I wouldn't. You know, I, you know I'm not that compassionate, right? And, and I don't know. It just strikes me as another interpretation, and it indicates to me that, that grace does not depend upon expected gratitude and how different that is from human relationships. And so another way in which Christian gratitude could be, should be, or ought to be different from a regular interpersonal gratitude. So... What I'm moving toward in my research is looking at now the other side of the equation, which is God's giving to us his unmerited favor. Quite apart from anything we've done to earn or deserve it or merit it, we respond to, grat to grace with gratitude, or at least we ought to, right? As Karl Barth said, that grace and gratitude go together like heaven and earth, that uh, gratitude is the echo of grace. Yeah, that's really what gratitude is. It's, it's this giving without... Uh, grace is giving without strings attached. We, we inhale grace and exhale gratitude or breathe in gratitude, exhale praise, that song by uh, Matt Redmond says, uh, really, you know, it's really where gratitude begins with grace. And for me, in my practice for gratitude, that little self thing I did with the, with the gratitude app, I found that, you know, focusing on myself, I stopped thinking about the grace I was receiving from God, but from others that it all begins there, and that gratitude without grace was unsustainable. Yeah, I could do it for a while. It's like people telling you you ought to be grateful, or we as parents, you know, pound into our kids, you know. Uh, you need to write that letter of thanks to Aunt Matilda for that sweater she bought you, right? And uh, you learn to do that, but you don't develop an authentic sense of thankfulness because it's imposed on you. It's not based on grace. It's based on an assignment Right, so I have a, a small grant to put together a team of researchers to try to figure out what grace is. Can we study, can we empirically study the concept of grace? You know, there's uh, evidence out there that people say, no, you can't really do that. I mean, that's, that's divine activity. Here's a quote by a psychoanalyst who said, grace is a divine activity. It's not open to human observation, and that's true. Obviously, it's, it's the, part of the character and nature of God. But well, you can study the human response to grace. We can look at people's reception to grace, their perception of grace, what difference it makes in their lives. So, of course, I consulted the master, uh, Dallas Willard. And what does he say about grace? Well, it turns out he said quite a bit about grace, which also could challenge some of the myths. That'll be a whole other list of you know, myths about grace, which is even greater than the myths about gratitude, where he said, you know, it's not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Some people think it's opposed to effort. If you, if you accept grace, you just sit back and do nothing. Accept that you're accepted and do nothing, right? Well, he said, no, you should do something, right? Because you need to work that out, the difference between sanctification and justification. Grace, he also said, is not just about forgiveness, right? He said, we would need grace even if we had never sinned, right? We would still need grace. Grace is God acting in our life to do what we cannot do on our own. Grace is what we live by, and the human system won't work without it. The saint uses grace like a 747 jet burns gas on takeoff, which is what you told me about at lunch today, Gary, and I had that in mind. I didn't add that if you saw I actually had that in there, but I could have, because I like that. If I hadn't heard it before, I would, have, I would have attributed that to you and said, that's really cool. But it's accurate. I mean, so much is based on this unmerited favor. It's just radical nature. Why is grace amazing? Because it's so radical. It so turns upside down the tables of how we normally relate to people in our lives. Conditionality, right? I do something, I get a reward. This says you get the reward anyway without doing something. It's just amazing. I guess that's why I call it amazing grace, right? So there's people out there who are trying to develop questionnaires to measure grace. It's pretty interesting. It's a good start, I think, to how people perceive of grace, you know? And you can ask people, because you can do that easily with psychologists. What we do, we create questionnaires, right? We do that, so... You can ask people their perceptions of the grace of the God. It's 
Uh, not the only thing you can do, but it's a good place to start and find out. Lo and behold, the people who perceive that they receive grace look better psychologically in terms of mental health, less guilt, less shame, uh, more self-compassion. They, they're, they're easier on themselves. But they have a healthy view of sin. They believe that they're sinners, right? Uh, but they don't get, uh, abs- get self-absorbed. Uh, or preoccupied by this sin. They, they believe that you know, God can rescue them and has from their sin. So we have this project that we call Project Amazing Grace. Uh, I don't know if that's the best title, but I kind of like it. It's, you know, uh, it makes a nice acronym. Uh, anyway, understand the nature of divine grace. So we're going to get together and, with a small team of people and try to figure out how can we make progress in understanding grace as a spiritual reality that can, in fact, likely change people's lives, change things. And there's some big questions we want to ask about divine grace. Is, does divine grace enable a person to flourish psychologically, relationally, spiritually? Same things we asked about gratitude, but now we're stepping back and looking now at the origins of gratitude within a Christian context. Why is it that so many people find grace a difficult concept uh, th- um, practically? That is, they don't want to give grace. They, they believe that there's, there's negative repercussions. If I give too much grace, unconditional support and acceptance of my kids, they're going to you know, go off the deep end. They're going to take advantage of it right, and do all these things. And, and so and what about me? Do I deserve this grace? I mean, I, you know, we, we, we feel like we should earn good things that occur to us, right? So I think there's lots of interesting psychological issues with respect to the reception, perception, and the, you know, um, I'm bringing grace into one's life. I want to close, though. I have a quote from, from Dallas, which I think doesn't have anything directly to do with grace or gratitude, but I like it. I mean, it's powerful, and it impacted me. So I'll read it out of the book, but I put it on the overhead as well. Actually, it has, this has something to do with grace when you get to the very end of it. He said, Nothing less than, than life in the steps of Christ is adequate to the human soul or the needs of our world. Any other offer fails to do justice to the drama of human redemption. I mean, any other offer, I mean, where else are you going to get the unconditional approval, acceptance, forgiveness of sins? Uh, you're not going to get that from a person. I mean, I have a, I have a golden retriever, and you know, he gives me some unconditional support, but he's got his issues too, right? So you're not going to get that anywhere. It's the best deal in town. I think that's what he's saying here. Anyway, life's greatest opportunity and abandons this present life to the evil powers of the age. The correct perspective is to see the following Christ not only as the necessity it is, but as the fulfillment of the highest human potentials and as life on the highest plane. It is in the following words, the Christian stands not under the dictatorship of a, of a legalistic you ought that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow in the chapel, if any of you go to. I'm going to talk about the, the two motivations for gratitude. One is out of guilt and fear, and the other one is out of grace and giving and the gospel and how they're very two different approaches to gratitude, only one of which is sustainable over time. So it's not about a legalistic or moralistic you ought, but in the magnetic field of Christian freedom under the empowering of the you may. And I think that's really the essence of the message of connecting God with grace, gratitude, the gospel. Obviously, Dallas said much better than any of us could say it. But it's very exciting to see the possibilities there for the future and to see more people understand the reality that gratitude is living in truth. I mean, it's the truest approach to life. And so I love thinking about gratitude and trying to help people think clearly about it because I think that's what, you know, one of Dallas's legacies, he wanted people to think clearly about things that matter, right? I mean, he was a philosopher. That's what philosophers do. They they, they think clearly. They're kind of pains in a sense because they always were pushing you. So what do you mean by that, you know? But that's a good thing. It's a good pain, right? We need that to be pushed in our thinking about what something is and what it's not and why it matters, so, uh, so it's a good pain. Uh, we need more of that. We need, need more people like Dallas to help us along in our journeys. So thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for listening.